Hello guys, uh, I'm going to start by saying that it's a pleasure um, to be here among people who have dedicated their lives and made it their life's mission to help other people for them to have more better and more functional lives. And I feel really honored to be among you guys. I'm going to start with telling you my story because the stories are what make people interesting and want to, what make us want to connect to each other. My story started when I first moved to the U.S. when I was 23 years old and it was 40 days after I got beaten up in school by the Revolutionary Guard. My school was this is the second political university in Tehran, Iran. And um, I didn't have any political affiliations. I was just out of school and there was a speech in school that the students were not allowed to give because the president hadn't signed off on it. And the reason he hadn't signed off was it was not aligned with the government's goals for the people and for the students. I got out of class, uh, just saw everybody running, and one of my friends said that the campus has three doors, they're closing all three. And everybody who is in campus is getting beaten up. So I'm running with a few friends trying to escape the walls and I look back, I see one of my girlfriends uh, who's pregnant, seven months, get beaten up. And before I knew it, I just started running to her. I pushed the guy who was beating her. And before I knew it, he punched it, punches me right in the nose. I hear my bones crack and my nose breaking and then I fell. He didn't stop, he went kicking me in the stomach. So if, I think a good 10, 15 minutes, I was getting like I was under his feet and he was not letting go. And it was, there were so many students getting beaten up that it was so hard to find people. But my friends managed to find me. And um, after a little while, some water, um, I got my senses back and um, I decided to go home with my bloody nose and bloody clothes because I was born uh, and raised in a very religious, traditional family. And um, I wasn't happy uh, going to school and feeling so stressed out and threatened all the time, not knowing if I'm actually gonna make it home or not. And this is an academic environment, so it was really unacceptable to me. I went home. My parents being religious and extremely traditional, mind you, they're very educated, so it's not because of lack of education. But they wouldn't let me uh, move to another country without being married first. It's because, well, it's given. I mean, as a woman, how can you take care of yourself, right? So I went home with bloody clothes and uh, broken bones. And I was like, I'm not gonna change my clothes. I'm not, I'm not gonna change it so my dad can see me proper so they don't have to worry, no. I'm not settling for going to school that I put so much effort into entering and getting beaten up in an academic environment. This is not okay. And, you know, my dad being the guy he is, very traditional, he said, well, you're not going anywhere. But look, you have two choices, neither. Let me go in peace, and you will be in my life. But I'm going either way. If you make calls here and there, because it's very much accepted and legal for a parent, the dad, to make a phone call to the customs and be like, she's not going anywhere. So he can actually stop me legally from um, going outside the country. Long story short, uh, again, I had broken bones, so they had to be fixed before I could actually get on a plane. 40 days after I got beaten up, I, on January, on February 2008, I was 
sitting in the plane, uh, connecting flight in Lufthansa, Germany, in Frankfurt. And I did not dare to take off my scarf before the plane actually went outside the borders of Iran. And that's because of the extreme control of the family and the society. And control always gives birth to extreme abuse. So I was always running. And when I came here, I was running from the family, the establishment, the society, and everything they wanted to put on me. I didn't know necessarily what I was looking for or what I was running towards. I just knew what I was running from. So I came here and all those fights, all those battles, really big battles, I didn't have the time or the capacity back then or the understanding to actually sit myself with myself and understand that all right, what is this that I'm experiencing and where is it affecting me? I got really fascinated by, um, I'm an avid reader, uh, when I was locked up in my room by my parents because I was a rebel and I would lose a track of time, the only thing I had in my room was my library, um, lots of books. So that was always my outlet. And um, through those books, I, came into the concept of positive psychology. So you see, I was again, raised in an environment, everybody was always trying to tell me how everything I was, everything I was doing, everything I wanted, everything I stood for, all my values were wrong, 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 wrong. And there was no right that, there was nothing that I did right. There was a checklist of right things that I had to abide by to be the right girl for my parents and then the society. Dr. Seligman is the person that changed this uh, mental environment for me with um, the science of positive psychology. What I want everybody today to keep in mind, and I know you guys already do, and it's me and fantastic being here with you guys. Um, I believe that human beings are all, as we say, a work in progress, but my terms are a masterpiece in creation because I believe that the fact that 8.2 million billion people live in this world and every single one of us has a unique fingerprint, that says something. It says that, again, every single one of us is here for a mission. And it's as unique as it is the fingerprint. And there's never a point that we stop growing, changes the essence of life. And uh, as human beings, our race will always be a race and it will always continue. So let's keep in mind that none of our learnings here, none of our experiences, nothing that we know is 100% and absolute. It never works binary. And I myself, I'm, I feel like I'm always learning. These two days with all of you guys prove that to me. Uh, I put this slide up because of the current events going on in my country the past three years. I, um, I decided to move to Iran in 2019 uh, because I wanted to teach positive psychology uh, to Iranian women. So they can claim their lives, claim their femininity, claim their power and their intelligence without being conditioned to think otherwise. This woman life freedom uh, movement was done by the girls in Iran who are in their teen years. They're hardly in their 20s and they beat a system a dictatorship that forced them to cover for 45 years. It was a very hard time for me because I was present in Iran and I was myself arrested nine days before Mahsa Amini, who's the face of this movement. 
the country and so the population, the families are in trouble and that trouble is the mental space of the people. Constant stress and fear brings out the world to the people. A uh, few people here that I talk to know that I came from Iran. I'm extremely sleep deprived and uh, jet lagged, but I'm here because of the same reason that you guys are here, to help somebody. And uh, this movement really resonated with me because again, I remember myself in the airplane not having the courage to take off my scarf. My dad and the Revolutionary Guard were not there. And I was in the plane and I was leaving, but I still couldn't. Positive psychology and how it appealed to me um, you see, in traditional psychology, the psychology in the 1950s up until the 2000s, always talks about getting rid of pain, of misery, curing what's wrong. So the individual is running in point zero, under point zero in a negative space. What traditional psychology does is Again, it, it's been done greatly, phenomenal research and body of knowledge behind it. But again, it was getting the individual from negative and moving them to the point zero. What wasn't discussed until the, the year 2000 was, all right, all right, after they moved to the point zero, what's after that? The concept of well-being was introduced by Dr. Seligman in the practice of positive psychology. In 1964, Dr. Seligman was in um, Pennsylvania graduate school, inventing and coming up with the really interesting concept of learned helplessness. This is, I guess, one of my favorite phrases because we never think that when we feel helpless, it's actually something that's learned and we're conditioned with it. You talked, you are an, a trauma expert. I really enjoy your talk on trauma. And what I learned about trauma is trauma on itself doesn't produce helplessness. It's inescapable trauma. It's you thinking that there is nothing I can do about this that brings helplessness. When people are faced with bad situations and bad events in their lives, there are two people, the optimists and the pessimists. These two groups have different styles when facing a potential hard time or problem. Pessimistic thinking style is when the bad event happens and the person tends to think that this is permanent, this is forever. The example is I lost, um, let's say they got rejected by a potential uh, person that they were interested in and after that they tend to think I'm unlovable nobody likes me I can never meet someone that's good for me and this is a permanent thinking style in their head the optimistic however does not see it that way they see everything that happens in the specific that specific increment of time that it happened it belongs to that time it's not going to affect everything else so it gives them a power to disassociate with it. The second one is the location of this um, bad thought that happens to both uh, people. Pessimistic people tend to think that whatever happens, whatever bad event happens, it seems to be pervasive. It affects all areas of their lives. They stop 
function. The optimist, however, thinks this belongs to this situation only. Maybe I'm not, if I'm not good at math, if I took a math test and my grade was bad, I'm not gonna think I'm stupid. I'm just gonna think that, all right, maybe this is something I'm not strong in. It's not my strongest suit. Third one is pessimists tend to be thinking and reflecting everything on themselves. Thinking that it's always my fault, not putting it anything on the outside or how that uh, the outside conditions could have affected them. But with the optimist, they will realize that it takes you to tango, so it's not always my fault. The fourth is, again, when these two groups of people are faced with bad events, the pessimist to th tends to think, There's, I can't do anything about this. This is done, it's over with. And the optimist has a tendency to think that I can control. I may not be able to control what happened, but I have control over this and I can move on. And that's the thought architecture of an optimist. My interest has been on the thought architecture and what makes us do what we do, think what we think, fear what we fear as women. And what I experienced myself um, thinking about the architecture of my own mind and how that mind affected my characteristics, I can tell you that they came from the conditioning from parents. The parents, everybody's parents are the first people they ever have met. First people that opened their eyes and lit their eyes are their parents. So their, your entire architecture and personality, the first few years of life, is shaped by them. They are your architects. And if the foundation is not good, the building's not going to last. The school system, religion and tradition, um, and the society and the family, in my case, and in so many other people's case, tend to view things linearly. Tend to think that if a woman's not achieving something, simply just depends on one single reason. There's only one thing that could have stopped them. Linear thinking is something that as people involved with helping other people and curing them, we cannot have. Linear thinking makes our world and our interaction with people very much two-dimensional. And as human beings, the beauty of this world is walking in a three-dimensional space. So linear thinking is poison. My master's thesis, my master's degree is in systems engineering. I studied uh, systems in George Washington University. And with a lot of fights, since it wasn't acceptable in the School of Engineering to have psychology, uh, I had to convince the dean that my thesis was going to be looking at humans as systems. And when I entered grad school, I did not have any perspective of if I'm going to go work for some company as an entry-level systems engineer. I was obsessed with systems engineering because I knew when I get out of school, it's going to shift my head and change me as a person, especially as a woman. So systems engineering is the field that focuses on, as you see, design, integrate, and manage complex systems. Humans are the most complex, most beautifully complex systems. And I decided to look at humans as CAS, which is complex adaptive systems. Another reason for my obsession with systems engineering is, again, it's the thought 
the architecture of thinking that it gives. And systems thinking, if you Google, will be defined as a being able to see and make sense of the complexities of the world with seeing the world as a whole. And again, non-linear thinking. And being able to tell the relationships, the complexities, and boundaries of a system um, without breaking the system in, into its functioning parts and knowing that human beings are not mechanical machines. One of um, the blind spots of traditional psychology in the 1950s was that both psychoanalytics and behaviorism, both schools of thoughts, were very deterministic. They believed that your future depends on everything you've been through as a child, and unless you actually solve those problems, you're not gonna be able to live a good life. So it leaves people with the thought that, all right, if I had a messed up childhood, I'm done, there's nothing I can do about it, it's over. But if we look at human beings as whole, as a whole system, and we don't look at our pain and our stress and our fears as flaws, and we take off that glasses, it's possible to see the flaws as the helping hand, as the strength, to see the fear as something that makes you grow. So you can imagine, um, as someone who was, I was a rebel, so I was constantly chased by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. There was a lot of fear for me there. And again, I told you, I, when I came here, I had no idea what I was gonna run towards, even if I could run it all. But the point of shift that comes, and it's really important, to keep in mind is that until 10, 20 years ago, we didn't really have a good grasp of the meaning, the real meaning of well being and what it entails. What does it mean if a person is happy? Do we look at this? Is there only one number that determines? Is there only one factor? So we didn't have that um, thinking in the 1950s, and positive psychology changed that because it came up with the idea that, all right, we didn't get to above zero, but let's not forget that if this whole traditional psychology didn't exist, nothing could be built on it. So positive psychology is a supplementary uh, science because according to, and again, I quote him, he, Dr. Seligman says that before positive psychology, psychology was half-baked because there was no ground above zero. And case an example, being myself, I always thought that, all right, so I ran from all those people, the establishment, the family, the government, hijab, religion, this and that. What now? It was only on the year 2016 that I actually started figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And this is eight years after I moved to the US. So you imagine I was going down the rabbit hole of my fears, my insecurities, my 
really poor self-image for eight years, trying to get a degree, trying to get to know other people from other cultures, trying to get my mind open, trying to get myself out of bed every day for a why. I didn't know what that why was until 2016. And I know that you guys are tired of me telling you the fact that I'm so obsessed with systems engineering, but I'm gonna say it again. Three characteristics that make me compare human beings and look at them as systems. When you look at human beings as complex adaptive systems, the first characteristic of a complex, complex system is a complex system is path dependent. What does it mean? It means that there, the system is always dependent on its initial definitions, its initial conditions. I want to parallel that to a child, a human child in adulthood is still very sensitive to every trigger that was left in them in their childhood. Second characteristic is nonlinearity. One of my favorite terms. It's that with all complex systems, when you look at a complex system, their response to the impacts that it receives from the environment are completely different. Parallel to human beings. If you have 10 people in the same situation and the same kind of fear, they're exposed to the same kind of fear, you will have 10 completely different responses. The third and my favorite characteristic of complex systems that applies to human beings also is adaptability and the reason it's important to understand that is because again in traditional psychology and how we uh, are programmed to think we're always trying to get rid of what's wrong what's stressing us what's giving us pain and we fail to consider that everything that gave us pain and suffering at some point had an afterthought after thought of all right how do i get up the adaptability characteristic says that the most efficient most beautiful complex systems are the ones who have order and and disorder simultaneously. So imagine if you take all the fears, the trauma, and everything that made this individual sad or unhappy or angry at some point or depressed in their life, if you take that away, there's no human being left. Because throughout their lives, our lives, we all tend to learn from those little steps that gave us fear, made us cry, made us angry, made us depressed. But when we're young, the apparatus is still new and we don't limit ourselves. But as we get older, those fears kick in. So it really, was really interesting to me that the most powerful, most beautiful human beings I've ever met in my life, none of them had an easy story. The stories I love listening to, and laugh and cry while listening to, they belong to people who had really difficult pasts, who fell down, bleeded, but clawed. Clawed their way out because they were like, all right, this is the only game in town.
One characteristic of thought is the immediacy of it. When we think about the fabric of our thoughts, we always know that there's not a thought that can be in the middle of this room without a person who possesses those thoughts. So they're not thoughts and feelings out in the space. Every thought and feeling ever thought or felt belongs to a human being and a vessel. The immediacy of attention is we all know that our thoughts belong to us. We know the immediate one thought that we're having at a moment, and then we have a complete understanding of the surrounding thoughts to that thought. Hold that thought right there. With human systems and systems in general, a disturbance is inevitable. All open systems, and there are very few closed systems in nature, all open systems only survive and function as they should only and only if they're disturbed, going back to my point, if there's no disturbance, the fears, the trauma, everything we've been through, we cannot make it in this world. I am uh, a big advocate of thinking in unity. I personally believe that one of the fragments of thought and thinking is the thought putting itself into games that it wants to get into. So if we pay attention to that instant, that immediate thought in the eternal moment of now, we all know our pasts, we're all looking forward to a future, but for that architecture, that thought architecture, to fix itself and get better and grow, there needs to be the thinking that is wholesome, that includes my fears, my pain, my shortcomings, my failings in the wholeness of me. When I have that, my, my attention into that immediate thought, that thought that's in the present, that one thought, if I get to reject one negative, one conditioning thought, one a day, only one, one thought, if I get to challenge one a day, the immediate thought in front of me, if I say, wow, I'm wearing this dress, I'm fat, I don't like it. No, but if I stand right there in the face of that thought and say, no, I look great and I feel great. One a day, then the architecture of the entire building starts to change. And I believe in that because I can't even count for you the amount of times that I found myself sitting on the bathroom floor feeling like the entire world was crashing on my head. But then there was always this light that even when I gave up, pushed me. And I can tell you firsthand with everything I've been through, that changing that one immediate thought, just one a day, whichever one you can, and not putting pressure on ourselves that, oh, I have to challenge seven of these habits and change three of these characters. No, one a day. So it's doable. 
It's not scary. It's not traumatic. It doesn't add something to my traumas with me wanting to get rid of them and adding something to them and feeling the guilt about not doing it. So my conclusion for all of you today is if I want to change the architecture of this phenomenal building, yes, I definitely have to work on what I went through and the holes that it left in me, but that only becomes possible with the rule of one. One thought a day, one battle, one a day. Thank you, and I'm open to questions. And is optimistic 100% or pessimistic 100%. I think it's very fluid. And um, I've seen and worked with clients who were optimistic on some views of their lives and pessimistic on others. And there's always a delicate balance. What I always tell clients is give yourself that space Give yourself the space to be pessimistic and to say it's going to go wrong, yet it can go wrong, but pay attention to that immediate thought. Right. That very that thought that's today. right in front of your eyes. Right. They get you to that, to that moment. Right? Yeah. Let's say you're pessimistic and you're like, oh my God, all right. So my own example, my shower had brown water this morning and I went to take a shower and I was like, God damn it, I have speech and now I'm all brown and I'm like, what? So I was like, all right, you have a speech about that immediate thought, act on it. I was like, okay, it's fine, you know, I'm going to take a shower with this. Personal, that optimistic. Because I thought I was thinking the same thing. Bingo. When I was, I was in it, and I was like, why is this water brown? I'm like, is it me or am I supposed to? And then it was that thought where it was like, when, it, rain, when it rains, it pours. Right, I don't have time because this is not just my there issue. There you go. Because I remember seeing the sign that they were working on the water. So I had to kind of connect instead of taking myself into that, I'm about to make this an issue. See, you already did Person. that. The immediate right. thought that you had, you weren't like, no. Right. Sit down. I've learned that. That's so, because where I can find myself. Precisely. Yeah. That right. exactly goes back to my point when I say that people's pain and their fear, it makes us grow so much. And we don't know that. We don't know that foundation of ourselves. We don't know those strengths and the concentration of strength in ourselves. So definitely, we're, we're all... And, not only in the past, we're going to continue to be both pessimistic and optimistic in different situations. And that's the way to be, right. just being aware of it. But just being able to come to that center point. Just right. when your thought is going to the rabbit hole, because it's the immediate thought that starts the rabbit hole. Right, right, right. Catch it. I think the opposite. I try to take my mind to the, because again, it was, I can make this an issue by taking it personal. All the time and everything I want, I want no brown water. But kind of, you know, that point of being 
you know, less not because I know that they, the hotel is not just one person. Yeah, whole, yeah, personal hotel and not personal. So why call with my making it about me? No, let's just kind of move on because they're having issues with the water staff. Precisely. The point I'm, anybody, any other questions? Uh, the point I'm going to leave you guys with is before I moved here, I also tend to see everything very binary, very zero one, very black and white. And the only thing that has helped me for these 14 years since I moved here was that immediate thought. I told myself, all right, I can't freak out because of the shower, the smell of it. No. That immediate thought, prepare your slides. You're sleep deprived, but it's okay. Prepare your slides. One thought. No, I can't. Yes, I can. And that was it. That yes, I can do this changed it. It changed the architecture. So do yourself a favor and all the immediate negative thoughts that you have. Thank you so much, Mayor, for this wonderful talk.